Well, the uh, last couple of years have uh, seen a, a rather dramatic bounce back from, from the troubles that we saw coming out of 2008 through 2010. So uh, the demand for, for uh, industrial applications continues to rise. We see a lot more in the way of uh, sales of, of new aircraft, which is driving a lot of uh, current demand. And uh, as we kind of look into the future, the, the uh, success and, and example by uh, BMW and a lot of the uh, sporting goods manufacturers is starting to trickle down into a lot of uh, boutique manufacturers, which is you know, maybe not a, a huge story within the, uh, the automotive material space, but that little portion of business is really a big influence on what's happening within the carbon fiber side. So as we look forward to the, the next five to 10 years, the uh, issues related to uh, energy, energy production, energy uh, savings, is really driving the, the demand for composites. So we see, you know, uh, wind energy being a, a continued uh, major consumer of materials and services. The automotive industry is expanding uh, in small bits, but for us as an industry, it's a, an awful lot to to grow to and a, a different way of, of approaching uh, manufacturing. And within the uh, within the aircraft industry, we still see a lot of growth on the tails of the A3. 30 at the 787 program as they go into full production and then what's happening with uh, China and, and Russia with their new uh, uh, single aisle programs uh, using uh, composite wings and a variety of other uh, large composite structures pushing growth for the next several years. Now I think there's uh, definitely some, some room to believe that uh, we're reaching maturity and saturation in the, the recreation and sporting goods markets as well as uh, maturity within the aerospace industry but there are so many new uh, evolving applications within within the, uh, the infrastructure and energy markets that it will not slow the development of, of composite materials and the suppliers and manufacturers of those materials. The industry has done a, a very good job of staying ahead of demand over the last couple of years and I think uh, based on the announcements that are already in place as well as uh, capacity that may not be fully utilized at the moment that uh, without uh, without too much further uh, development, uh, we should be uh, on track to, to meet supply and demand uh, over the next, uh, next four or five There's years. still quite a bit of variability in, in the demand for industrial markets considering uh, the, uh, some of the applications are very technically oriented. If we could look at uh, industrial rollers for, for webs and film uh, manufacturing and they require very uh, high tensile uh, materials, the intermediate modulus and high modulus materials. Uh, but the vast majority are, are standard modulus uh, high strength materials like what we see going into uh, the, the pressure vessel and wind energy markets, two of the fastest growing markets uh, in the world. Uh, they are looking for uh, materials between uh, 24k toe and and 50k toe, uh, it, and that's uh, mostly a result of, of trying to keep up with the manufacturing uh, uh, throughput that they that they have to achieve. But some of these uh, some of these uh, applications require the production of of uh, one or two thousand pound components in the course of a day or two, and they have to do that. All the, the number of uh, vehicle models that uh, use uh, carbon composites uh, globally, there are about 1,500 different vehicles uh, that are, are manufactured uh, by model. And when we look at those that uh, specify carbon fiber as OEM equipment, uh, we're really only looking at about 100, 110 different uh, vehicles. And most of them use uh, composites for, for largely aesthetic purposes rather than the performance. They like the image uh, of composites. Uh, that being said, there's been a, a significant uh, a change towards uh, major structural components uh, that we're not really as concerned about how they look uh, under the uh, magnifying glass or, or under the sunshine at a, a car show. And so there's a, a definite change in, in how the carbon fiber is being used and perceived. Uh, with that involved, um, we're 
uh, we're definitely seeing some uh, some advances with the, the, the resin chemistries and the heat and the curing processes, which are enabling uh, uh, the industry to move from uh, boutique type vehicles, where maybe 500 vehicles a year was the maximum that could realistically be produced, to something akin to five to six thousand. Uh, vehicles a year, and then we've seen uh, recent uh, developments uh, with uh, BMW beyond their i3 or i8 platforms that uh, indicate that they're ready to, to move into uh, vehicle platforms with you know, 70 to 80 thousand vehicles a year, which is uh, a dramatic improvement. Uh, that being said, uh, it's going to be quite a while before the supply chain is able to accommodate more than uh, the luxury vehicle niche. And I think it will probably be at least 10 or 15 years before we see uh, significant uh, expansion beyond the luxury market for, for carbon deposits, with the exception of, of uh, a few spoilers or other, other uh, small parts that can be manufactured inexpensively and at high volume. I believe that the decision to go ahead with the development of a new single aisle replacement for the Boeing 787 or A320 is really paced by uh, developments in the engine, uh, aircraft engine market. Without, uh, without the aircraft engines providing a 20% or more improvement over the, the latest generation, like the, the Leap 1s going into service uh, uh, right now, uh, that the, uh, there's very little justification from the airframe side to, to move forward with the new platform. Uh, with that involved, um, uh, we kind of look at uh, conceptual uh, uh, ideas of what the, the next generation single aisle uh, might look like, and it's uh, hard to to imagine that uh, uh, the ch airplane is going to change too much if uh, if uh, if the uh, manufacturing paradigm for, for composites doesn't uh, evolve as well dramatically over the next ten years. When you consider uh, the, the wing. Uh, that the, the weight savings is uh, substantial enough uh, relative to uh, metal, uh, aluminum, aluminum, lithium alloys that uh, that is uh, a uh, it's something that uh, Boeing and Airbus will definitely push for. The empennage and, and control surfaces are already there. Uh, the big question is whether or not it's justifiable or feasible to produce a fuselage uh, out of out of carbon composites. Right. Uh, based on today's current state of the art, I'd have to say no. Uh, we have to uh, be able to reduce the the weight of uh, carbon composites on a, on an aircraft that size, probably about five to ten percent, and the cost of manufacturing that another five ten to ten percent to be competitive with an aluminum design. And then when you look at the logistics, the, uh, the single aisle aircraft are produced at a rate of uh, five to six times uh, what uh, the, the twin aisle uh, aircraft are, which means that uh, the, the manufacturing uh, uh, throughput uh, of those uh, components needs to be at least four or five times what they are today in order to make uh, a decision to go ahead with a composite fuselage even practical. So there, there are a number of major challenges, and uh, it is questionable to, uh, whether or not the next 10 years will provide enough solutions to make that possible. That being said, the, uh, the order books for Boeing and Airbus uh, definitely will support the, the continued production of the A320 and 737, at least through the middle of the next decade, and, and possibly for, for several years beyond that. So uh, from, from an OEM standpoint, there may not be an immediate push to, to jump to a solution when the technology doesn't quite justify doing that.